As we dive into today's Michigan football report, I do want to give you guys an update at our push toward 25,000 subscribers. We've got the most subscribers of any uh, YouTube channel that covers the Michigan football team on a consistent basis. So we're sitting at 24,371 at about 70 or so just from last night's video. So appreciate everyone who subscribed. Send a link to a friend if uh, they're a Michigan football fan and you want to kind of get them to join the community. But I think 25,000 is going to be a really big, cool milestone for us. So we're going to give it an extra few pushes as we are leading up to Christmas week and then of course, into the college football playoff matchup versus TCU. All right, folks, I am your host, James Yoder. You're watching the Michigan Football Report Mailbag. Plus, you know, add a little rumors in there, uh, kind of a, some juicy topics uh, that I will expand on a little bit. But I put out a, a mailbag call on Monday, midday or so, and got a bunch of really great questions from Twitter, Facebook, and here on our YouTube community. First question we're going to dive into from my guy, Blue Blitz, longtime uh, uh, follower. We discuss things on Twitter, etc asks, why is this team better than the 2021 team? So I gave up the five reasons why I actually now do believe that Michigan's 2022 team is better than last year's 2021 team. But I'll ask you guys this question before I give you my thoughts. Which is a better team? The defensive-led Aiden Hutchinson, uh, David Ojabo, Daxon Hill, Hassan Haskins group from last year. If it's them, go ahead and type 21 down in the comments. If it's the 2022 team, type 2222. I will pin this comment right beneath the video, so just go reply to the pinned comment. All right, my takeaways, folks, why 2022 is turning out to be a better season. I think Michigan will make uh, the national championship game. Hell, I'm picking them to win the national championship game. We will dive into there. First up, year two of a winning culture, right? 2021, I think as Michigan got into the 2021 season, they're still kind of coming off two and four COVID season, all that different stuff. Um, I don't know if they really understood what they had as a team, maybe until five, six, seven uh, games into the year, where this team, they went into it knowing they're the Big Ten champions, knowing that they have the opportunity to uh, uh, continue things rolling. So year two winning culture, the interior of the defensive line has really been uh, such a nice upgrade. We thought when Chris Hinton left that Michigan would struggle in there, but Michigan has had consistent guys. Mason Graham, obviously Mozzie Smith has stepped up his game. J.J. McCarthy's running, running threat. I don't think Michigan's passing game is notably better yet so far this year, maybe in a couple spots than it was with Cade McNamara, but the threat of J.J. McCarthy, and sometimes him actually doing it, like in the Ohio State game, the threat has certainly opened up holes for Diamond Edwards, for Blake Corum. I, hell, I think uh, some of the Diamond Edwards stuff in the second half against Ohio State, you could argue that uh, you know just at least a pause by the Ohio State linebackers and uh, D linemen was that maybe McCarthy would pull it back and take off on the other side. Uh, upgraded cornerback play, the emergence of Will Johnson, uh, Gima Green kind of having a second life as a starting cornerback, and DJ Turner has performed as good or better this year, so Michigan's really got three cornerbacks, plus uh, Mike Sanders still, nothing has really fallen off from Daxon Hill last year, and with Olu Oluwatimi, last year's offensive line was maybe one of the best we've seen in you know two decades for Michigan, this year's I'm thinking could be the best offensive line in the history of the program, so those are my five reasons, make sure you guys comment on that pinned uh, comment there, 2021, type 2021, type 21, or 2022 team, give me a 2-2. What are your thoughts on Cade McNamara on the Jordan Palmer podcast? Folks, I've had a bunch of people on social media, on Twitter, YouTube comments, etc. Um, I, I addressed it last week on our live show Thursday. We published that segment on, uh, on Saturday. So there's going to be a little thing that pops up like right here above my head, right there, actually. I'm going to grab it, give it to you guys. Uh, you click on that. It'll take you to the video, the 305 mark. It should drop you right in the 305 mark. If it doesn't, just scrub forward to 305. I give you my thoughts on Cade McNamara and what he said and some of the good things he did in Michigan, but also maybe some of the things I wish he would have just left as is uh, and didn't have to address as a uh, Michigan football now transfer heading off to Iowa. So go ahead and click on that card right there. All right, folks, we are presented by Fetch. The Michigan Football Report is brought to you by Fetch, the super and easy to use app and free app that allows you to earn rewards on literally anything you buy. Just scan any physical receipt or e-receipt and you will earn points for your purchases. And the process only takes seconds. And you don't have to worry about where a receipt is from or what's on it. So let me show you right here on the phone on the screen here how simple it is. All you do is open up the Fetch app. You press the orange camera button and snap a photo of a receipt and hit submit. You'll then see that confetti pop coming up here showing you that you've earned reward points. It's a simple process. You also click on the e-receipt function to get rewarded for your Amazon purchases or other online shopping by just syncing up your email account. Uh, you then can redeem those points for gift cards at 
places like Amazon, Starbucks, or any of hundreds of retailers and restaurants that are available in the Fetch app. It's available for iPhone and Android. Make sure you use our link because we've got a bonus going on, 5,000 bonus points when you sign up using promo code chat and you scan your first receipt. So you sign up using that link. It'll drop you on the App Store, iPhone, Android. Use promo code chat at sign up. Scan your first receipt. 5,000 bonus points. That's equivalent to a $5 gift card, and it's absolutely free, folks. Get started now. The link is in the comments and the description of today's video, or you can just type it into your browser on your phone right there. Chatsports.com slash fetch. Enter promo code fetch. 5,000 bonus points is only available for a limited time, so don't wait. Great thing to do during the holidays. Of course, you have a bunch of purchases. I have redeemed over $60 in uh, gift cards just by scanning my receipts and connecting my Amazon account. Chatsports.com slash fetch. All right, next question coming up from Andrew Sla. He says, how can Michigan contain uh, control of Max Duggan with uh, scrambles or throwing multiple 50-yarders down the field like he did against Kansas State? So your 2022 Heisman runner-up, Max Duggan, pretty epic year because if you guys remember <clears> – <throat> He wasn't even the starter for them, much like Michigan with J.J. McCarthy. Max Duggan was not even a starter in the opener, right? You had to have an injury to uh, to the guy who won the, the battle in the fall camp for Max Duggan to uh, get in there at the end of their first game and then have this Heisman uh, runner-up season. Really good stats. 65% completion, 3,300 yards. That TD interception rate shows you that he does not make mistake. Michigan, what they can't do with him that they could do against Coldridge Stroud is they let Stroud, they just drop six, seven guys, eight guys sometimes back into coverage. Let, let the defensive line attack Stroud. Stroud would never take off and running. Duggan can definitely hurt you running. So my keys to beating TCU, folks, in Michigan needs to score 30 points. I think that's pretty obvious. You're going to have to do that against a good team like TCU uh, no matter what. I think Michigan needs to have a little bit faster start because TCU is maybe the best, if not one of the few best uh, – teams, I'm not even saying this year, maybe one of the few best in college football history at winning close games. Go look at the schedule, folks. They have like eight or nine games that they have had within a score, uh, and almost every single one of their games, except for a couple, have been 10 points or less. So the games are close. They can win them. And really, the game against Kansas State was the only one they really didn't. And what happened there? Kansas State got up early. They were up uh, by multiple scores late in the fourth quarter. TCU had to really come roaring back. Couldn't get it done in overtime. Uh, I think that if you stop TCU from running, make them pass the ball. That is where Duggan does not feel as comfortable. If they're getting the ball going on the ground, uh, of course, it makes the pass a lot a bit easier. Um, I think J.J. McCarthy needs to have another breakout game because TCU, like other teams, they are going to key in on Michigan's running game. So I do think this is a potential for J.J. to kind of like show what it, we've seen in spurts throughout the year, especially at times during the Ohio State game. And let's get some hits to the max. A uh, little play on words there. Max Duggan, he can take off scrambling. He can let guys, you know, three, four wide receivers go down the field. Devon's line comes to the outside, steps up in the pocket. Everyone's back turn, turn to him, covering guys. He can take off for 15, 20. Hell, we saw it against Kansas State in the fourth quarter. 40-yard runs, multiple, you know, 25-plus-yard runs uh, on that one drive alone. So you got to hit him, make him scared when he scrambles. You don't want anybody to get hurt, but you certainly don't want him confident running down the field. So hit him early, hit him often, make him start hearing ghosts like they've done to Stroud over the last couple of years. But I want to know from you guys as we are talking more about Michigan TCU, give me a score prediction. Wolverines and the Horn Frogs coming up 4 o'clock Eastern on New Year's Eve. Uh, exciting game. I think Michigan should win. I'm expecting them to win. I uh, want to know what your score predictions are. I think I've given a few score predictions, but I'm sticking with it. If I recall, Jack, you remember, I think it was 35 to 15, I think it was my score prediction. No, 35 Yes, 15. I said they're going to kick uh, to 22. I can't remember what I said. Did I say 22? I can't remember. 35, uh, I think I said 22, actually. So um, I'll think about what it is, but I did think I, I said TCU was going to score kick after kick five field goals, just like Purdue did. Uh, I think Michigan's going to score 35 points. Maybe, uh, maybe they'll get up there in the 40s again. <clears throat> Next question coming up from Logan Stutzman. He says, what's your personal thoughts on if Blake Corm will declare for the NFL or come back for senior year and get his degree? One question there on Blake Corm. Another one, so we're going to kind of combine these two. From Michigan Made, my guy here, will Corm uh, come back for senior year? He's making NIL money already, and if he comes back next year, uh, he'd go down as uh, go from a third-round pick because that's where he's being projected, third, fourth, maybe fifth, who knows, uh, to a first-round pick and possibly win the Heisman. If you were him, what would you do? Um, unless Michigan can come through – with a very well thought out plan that says, hey, here's what a third round pick makes or a fourth round pick makes for their first rookie contract. Um, here's what you can make of your first rounder. And here's what you're going to make next year as a rookie in the NFL. 1.3 million, 1.6 million, whatever that number is. Um, I don't have the figures in front of me. I haven't kept up that much with it, but Michigan certainly should know it. And 
if it's not crazy to think that Michigan sh could get a name, image, and likeness deal that is equivalent to what a rookie contract for a non-first round pick would be for Blake Corum. If you do that, sure, get yourself a, uh, you know, potentially get yourself a uh, an insurance policy in case you have a re-injury, but I don't think you should come back for any Heisman deal, but if it's financially sound, then maybe. Someone made a good point a few weeks ago, I heard. They said, imagine if NIL uh, existed with Denard Robinson uh, at Michigan. Didn't have much of a pro career, hung around the Jags for a couple years. Um, but how much could he have made his, you know, his sophomore year? He uh, had 1,600 yards rushing and you know, f set every record for touchdowns, uh, you know, 20 touchdowns rushing, 20 touchdowns passing. You guys know the drill. How, many, how much money could he have made in, 20, in 2011 and 2012, his uh, third and fourth year at Michigan, under NIL? And if he was a third-round prospect, which he wasn't, like Blake Corum is, would he have stuck around Michigan for his senior year if the money was there? So Blake Corum doesn't have necessarily the name recognition that Denard did uh, uh, back, you know, after, especially after his sophomore year, but it's something to consider if Michigan can get their act together on NIL. Maybe they'll do it. I don't think that Blake Corum, after we saw, he was hurt last year, folks. He was hurt this year, uh, got surgery. I would try his best unless there's some financial uh, you know, incentive that I don't know about. Go uh, to the NFL, try and get drafted this year as high as you can. But I want to ask you guys, what should Blake Corum do? Uh, just go down in the comments. I want to uh, go into our YouTube dashboard and just do a search for stay, search for go. So just give me one comment on what do you think he should do. Uh, three years at Michigan, should he stay for a fourth year or should he go? Comment one of those two things down below. Jordan Coyle with the question. He says, JJ is the only CFP quarterback to not be nominated as a Heisman finalist. As you guys saw, uh, Coldred Stroud, Max Duggan, obviously uh, the winner, Caleb Williams uh, was as well, and then uh, Stetson Bennett from Georgia. So three of the four quarterbacks in the CFP were Heisman finalists. JJ wasn't. Do you think he's going to prove his doubters wrong? Another JJ question coming in from Ben from our Facebook page. It is facebook.com slash Harbaugh Go Blue. He says, how much do you think the passing game? And I think this is an interesting one because there's two thoughts and two factors here. First one is, do you think JJ felt snubbed? Okay, does he feel snubbed by not being a Heisman finalist? Yeah, he didn't really deserve to be a Heisman finalist, so maybe not. But how much of his passing game struggles early in the year were from the fact that he wasn't available during spring ball and he was splitting reps with Cade during the fall? It's interesting to see because J.J. McCarthy is going to have 28 days from the Big Ten Championship game on, was it, December 3rd, right, to December 31st. So he's actually going to get almost a full fall camp and more than even a full spring camp being able to train as a Michigan starting quarterback. When he got into the season, Cade's still around for a little bit, but then you're getting the, the reps of the next game and all that stuff. You don't really get a true like training camp feel like you do for bowl season. Last two games, he's not necessarily played – great from a completion percentage uh, you know, perspective. He's just completing just over 40 or 50% of his passes, 23 of 41 against Ohio State and Purdue. Um, but he's scoring touchdowns, six passing touchdowns, which is a big tick up because throughout the year, J.J. McCarthy leading up until the Ohio State game, he only had three touchdown passes two times all year, has had three touchdowns each of the last two games. So he's had four three touchdown passes, uh, passing games this year. Two of those uh, four came in the last two games. Only one interception, uh, really odd throw he made against Purdue. I didn't like it at all. Um, and he's doing, the, doing it with his feet, right? Not putting up huge numbers, but he's a threat. Scored a touchdown in the red zone. Um, I think the 28 days of being the only quarterback that's getting any first team reps from Michigan actually will pay much bigger dividends than uh, you know getting all those reps during the season because Michigan can kind of reset, uh, go through the entire playbook, go back to the basics in some regards, just like they do in spring ball every year, just like they do in the first week or two of fall camp. KJ, longtime commenter, uh, longtime feature on the show. He says, um, will Michigan add any high-level running backs uh, this offseason? Well, Cole Cabana is coming in as a 2023 recruit, early enrollee, so he'll be there for spring ball, uh, and I'm pretty excited about him. But how about this guy? Been hearing a ton of buzz about him since, like, Friday, Saturday last week. And as you saw on the show yesterday, we talked about him in as a top potential target for Michigan. Um, he's one of these guys graduate from Vanderbilt, uh, has had multiple schools. Vanderbilt was a second school, was able to transfer into there, and is now going to be a, uh, a grad student coming into uh, his next uh, destination. 1,042 rushing yards for Vanderbilt, only the 10th running back in school history at Vanderbilt to have a 1,000-yard season. 
He is Michigan's top target. No guarantees they get him or anything like that, but uh, is definitely the eyes to keep out for and is the name I have heard absolutely the most for uh, over the past week or so when it comes to a running back after Braylon Allen kind of squashed rumors that he might transfer from Wisconsin. All right, guys, if you have not joined us the last few weeks, uh, we're now switching up on Thursdays. We are live, so we're going to go an hour earlier this week at some scheduling concerns with Thursday Night Football and that stuff at the office. So, 5 o'clock Eastern. Um, this is the helmet. If you guys haven't watched uh, our Super Chat helmet, 10 bucks Super Chat gets you on the helmet. I'm filling this thing up with dollar bills uh, and going to give away a Blake Quorum signed football. want to give some shout-outs here. Shane Johnson, my guy. Uh, Dan Ferrer, Ferrara. Dan, I keep messing that up. Rock City, uh, Wolverine, Alaska. Blue Wolverine, John Blaze. Rick Harford, uh, Blue Wolverine's in there a ton. Cool Moti, uh, Wolverine Alaska, we mentioned him. Also his daughter, Leanne, Mr. Bojangles, 870. Uh, Jeremy Clore got on there. Steven Murs, my guy, Josh Sherwood. Uh, appreciate all you guys. Have three or four that we've got a helmet that's getting delivered tomorrow. So by Thursday's show, we will have four or five more stickers that uh, couldn't fit. The helmet, first helmet's filled up. So we're going to start another helmet uh, coming up on Thursday, 5 o'clock Eastern. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you set yourself a reminder to join us at 5 Eastern. Tom Downey, uh, Chat Sports NFL uh, Daily Legend, hopes of the Cowboys report. Getting a little wild there in uh, the comments. Bigger fraud. I don't like the word fraud. Let's see, that seems a little harsh, but bigger fraud, Ryan Day or Josh Gaddis. Fraud's not the word I'm going to use, but I'm going to use this word. Josh Gaddis and Ryan Day are two of the all time coattail riders in history, right? Josh Gaddis went to Alabama when they had two as their quarterback. They had four first-round wide receivers. He was the and then like two or three first-round running backs, right? Uh, Najee Harris, Josh Jacobs. I can't remember who the third one was. And that was the year he spent in Alabama. And he was the co-OC, even though he really wasn't. He took that, rode Nick Saban's coattails, and like nine first-round picks on that 2018 uh, Alabama team and turned into like, oh, speed and space. We're just going to tear up college football. All-time coattail riders. He's done absolutely nothing since. If you think 2021 was his offense, you're still kidding yourself. And then Ryan Day. The further Ryan Day has gotten away from working under Urban Meyer, the worse everything he's doing is, right? He has turned into the Texas Tech of the North. He's turned Ohio State into a very soft program. So, folks, I'm going to ask you guys this question. Who is the bigger bum? I'm not going to use the word fraud. Bum, coattail rider. Josh Gaddis riding coattails of uh, Nick Saban. And then, honestly, Jim Harbaugh, right? Got the Burroughs Award, went on to Miami. Absolute disaster here at Miami. Or Ryan Day uh, took over an Ohio State team that was absolutely loaded, maybe the best team in college football in the last 20 years not to win a title. Uh, and they've kind of gone consistently down from there. Now, they're still a damn good program. He's only lost five games in four seasons. So he's not necessarily uh, that much of, a, of a, a fraud, but definitely a bum. And uh, I think one of the great coattail riders kind of rode Ryan uh, Urban, Dale, Urban Meyer's coattails to, uh, to get a big-time contract at Ohio State. Let me know down in the comments. Give me a JG or an RD, the bigger bum out of these two men right there, Ryan Day or Josh Gaddis. All right, folks, we will be back Wednesday before Thursday's live show of another video for you tomorrow, so make sure you subscribe, youtube.com slash Michigan TV. Until I see you tomorrow, go Blue.